Hello, listeners. Been wondering how you can help the show? Probably not. But here are five things you can do. One, subscribe. Support the show by clicking the subscription link in the show notes. Two, review on iTunes, on our website, www.afraidofnothingpodcast.com, or on whatever app you listen to. Three, donate. When you go to our website, click the cute coffee cup icon. Or in the show notes, click the subscription link. Four, share. Sharing really is caring. Tell your friends and even your enemies to check out the show. Five, watch. Wait a minute. It's a podcast, not a movie. Actually, it's both. Check the show notes to find out where to watch the documentary. You can also rent it on Prime Video. That's it. Oh, one last thing. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Bucolic Berkshires, nestled in western Massachusetts, home to hiking, skiing, Tanglewood concerts, theater, and... Oh, the horror. Who's it, Tuttle? The Bloody Pit UFO Abductions. Bigfoot. Exorcism. Murders at Summer Camp. Ghosts in Haunted Castles. The Old Coot of Greylock. Join us as we travel down and explore mysterious things in the Berkshires with Joe Derwin. In a world where nothing is known, nothing is certain, reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host with the ghost this is my podcast based on my paranormal documentary afraid of nothing each episode we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens join me who is this large man and what's he doing in our bedroom as we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie this is afraid of nothing all right we're here with joe derwin a folklore and historian of the berkshires in massachusetts among many other things joe welcome to the show hey it's great to be here cool now give us uh i mean you do so much more than what i just said give us kind of an introduction or a smattering of all the things that you do you know, I'm I'm a kind of uh, sometimes journalist, uh, content creator. Uh, I started writing a column about oddities in the Berkshires uh, 16 years ago, and that's run in various forms in different publications. I like to follow things down rabbit holes, so sometimes uh, I get way out of my intended field of expertise, and uh, it's a good time, and uh, it's certainly think the pursuit of information is a very important thing in our times. You remind me of another guest I had, Jeff Belanger, who's a researcher for Ghost Adventures, New England Legends. You're kind of like the Western Mass version of him. You have many diverse interests, yet you've been kind of like very much tied to Western Massachusetts and the Berkshires. Can you tell our audience exactly what is the Berkshires? What are the kind of the towns within the Berkshires? And what are some of the maybe notable or famous or infamous names that they may not recall are associated with the Berkshires? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question because there's been kind of a lot of discussion and debate even uh, over the last 150, 200 years about what exactly the region of the Berkshires, the technical county of Berkshire County in Massachusetts. So you have Berkshire County, Massachusetts is 32 towns in the, in the westernmost part of the state, running south to north from Connecticut, the Connecticut border to the Vermont border, and bordering New York State as well. So in actual cultural practice, the idea of the Berkshires 
sometimes a bit of Vermont's included, sometimes a bit of New York, Connecticut, Twin Lake. You know, it's funny because I will drive, I'll be an hour or so out of Massachusetts and I'll still, I'll still see a business that's like virtual landscaping or something like that. So there's a kind of a concept of the uh, rural region kind of in, in a bigger sense. And that's sort of what I've stuck to as, as, uh, originally my column was for a publication that covered parts of three states. So I, I take a kind of liberal view on what my backyard for, for folklore and journalism is. What are some of the names? What are some of the people from the Berkshires that we, you know, that we may be aware of, but not realize that they either were born here or spent a large portion of their lives in the Berkshires of Western Mass? Well, you know, right off the top, there's this amazing literary history in the 19th century in the Berkshires where you have Herman Melville living in Pittsfield, writing Moby Dick, pursuing a friendship with Nathaniel Hawthorne, who lived um, in Lennox, this Stockbridge area, and he was writing in the Berkshires, and uh, they were introduced to each other by Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., uh, another great, eminent writer of the age, and then we had uh, some Phenomenal early female writers like Catherine Sedgwick and Edith Warren's estate, which is uh, reputed to be quite haunted and is, is a, a major cultural venue in the county now. So you, you've got a lot of that kind of history. It's certainly a melting pot for cultural endeavors. And we have the, uh, the Tanglewood home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and a lot of world-class theaters. So we're still kind of very much meshed in the, the larger cultural icons and having famous actors here in the summers. Isn't like Norman Rockwell from that area? Or I know is yeah, know. yeah. Rockwell's uh, home base was here. His uh, his house is now a museum, very well renowned museum. Yeah, there's uh, the Clark Art Museum has a major uh, collection, and then of course we have uh, the newer Mass Mocha Museum. So we, there's a uh, one of the largest kind of economic drivers for, for the county now is kind of that cultural history that goes back even to the early 1800s to uh, William Colin Bryan, one of the early major American poets based in the Berkshires and wrote extensively about the Berkshires and left a lot of folklore behind. So um, that's, you know, aside from our industrial kind of roller coaster, this, this sort of uh, cultural aspect of the Berkshires has been a huge part of the the economy, the history, the day-to-day life. Before we dive into some of the great stories and folklore of, of the Berkshires, I'd like to just talk about a couple of things that you've touched on in, in your past writing career and research. The first one is something called colrophobia or fear of clowns, which you wrote about in a study in 2004, which has actually been cited by several scientific papers and is a primary source on that subject in Wikipedia. What drove you to write about fear of clowns back in 2004? Yeah, well, yeah, I think the when I first wrote about it, it was kind of, um, I, was, I was still in college and I was looking for information about it because I think it was really becoming pretty prominent in pop culture. And I went looking for academic literature, this very, seemingly very common phobia, and it, it really wasn't there. So I had to dig a little deeper and I had to go into a, a few different disciplines and kind of compare uh, everything from horror movies to the anthropology of clowning in indigenous cultures and really try to piece together the how and why of how this something that was really popular entertainment icon just a few decades ago went from to being popular a horror meme as werewolves or vampires, you know, this kind of perpetual uh, monster. Yeah, you're, you're, you're ahead of your time. <laughs> Were you surprised at like how often it was cited and referenced that like, it really got some legs? Did that surprise you? Um, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think there, there's kind of within, within the study of colorophobia, there's this sort of fascinating element of urban legend and mass hysteria where there, there have been these phantom clown panics where people report clowns really bothering children in metropolitan areas. And that, of course, has been going on for a while, but it really took off four years ago and kind of swept the entire country in a, in a, in a hugely public way that it hadn't before. So that was almost kind of, you know, I'd been waiting for years for that, not not really expecting it to ever blow up to that extent. Was there any clowning happening in the Berkshires at all? Did that ever happen? Or was that something you just had an interest in, but it, it wasn't Berkshires-based, but you just 
you know, we're ahead of the we're ahead of the curve. No, I had read about a mass panic that they had in the Boston area in '81, which I, I was a young child, and so I had some historical background on that. But then in 2016, it sort of it did eventually hit the Berkshires, and it almost you know I sort of almost knew what day it was going to because the the fascinating thing about what happened four years ago is instead of most things like when they they spread virally kind of in all directions because of the internet and it, it's all over the world at once. That was something that really seemed to happen by region. And it was like sightings in one county and then another county. And it was always like moving from one adjacent area to another. And it kind of slowly crept up the East coast and slowly crept West. And it was like day by day. And you can almost tell by the news reports where it was going to be probably hit next. So yeah, I, I had even been in contact with the, the local school superintendent and police chief and things about how, how to handle it if it did hit here locally, which eventually there were, you know, alleged reports and just not to, not to feed into it being the main thing. Yeah. It, it really is a kind of more of a cultural phenomenon and copycatism than, than anything. Yeah, no, that's always fascinating. I mean, there's another thing that you are actually do, which I'd never heard of. It's called, it's got a name which I doesn't. I don't think it's actually accurate for what it really is. It's called recyclercism, which is the art of ritual transformation of found objects, particularly like masks and dolls. Can you kind of give us some clarity on what that is and what drew you to it? Oh, geez, yeah. I mean, uh, that's it's that's probably more about a, a hobby in my spare time that is acquired an overly pretentious name. Yeah, I, I, I like you know I, I've never had any real artistic skill, drawing, painting, anything two dimensional, so. But what, what uh, has always been interesting to me is kind of reassembling toys and dolls. Even when I was a kid, you know, I'd kind of take the head off one thing and put it on another and stuff like that. And, you know, I've always had kind of a, a crafting impulse and attraction to <laughs> adhesives and things like that. So, yeah, I, I'll, uh, you know, I'll find old masks, mostly masks and dolls and things like that, and uh, take it uh, kind of in a creepy Martha Stewart sort of way um you turn it into a, a very different kind of object wow well, yeah the, any were any of these <laughs> objects ever haunted or have did you ever come across you something you didn't know had like a doll that had maybe a a curse or an entity attached to it and you had some weird stuff happen after you if you recycled it well you know i always kind of played it safe because <laughs> i tend to be a bit agnostic about these things but i i also uh why why roll the dice so i, I when i find you know some new thing in a a bin at Goodwill or something like that. I do kind of uh, try to observe some, I don't want to say a cult necessarily, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a, a ring of salt or something for a couple of days, burn some sage around it, you know, yeah. just just uh, make sure, you know, because it, it's, it's funny because it kind of, I kind of got into really doing that as a way to relax during a time when haunted dolls and stuff like that were just booming business on eBay. And I should have really gotten into that because I think a lot of people, you know, they just find a doll and write up a creepy story and it would sell for hundreds of dollars, you know, just based on the story. of. And it always kind of amazed me that people wanted, people would want to buy this object that had allegedly created total havoc in someone else's home. But they're like, yeah, I got to have that. So I, I probably should have. Uh, monetize that a little better, but yeah, you, you can you can still do it, my friend, because I see uh, a lot of like the YouTube paranormal channels in the past couple of years that open up these internet these boxes from the you know the black web or whatever, or get these haunted dolls or these duka boxes, whatever they call them. But yeah, you, you probably could still have a market for that. So now with that as a setup, let's just go into have you regale us with some of the the ghost stories and mysteries of the Berkshires. I'm going to throw out some topics, and if you could just kind of go off on it for a little bit. Let's start with the Hoosick Tunnel, the Bloody Pit. Want to give us kind of the backstory on that? Yeah, I mean, the Hoosick tun Tunnel has been uh, such a defining part of of history and folklore in the Berkshires. Um, it really changed the dynamic in, in a lot of ways. It was kind of, a lot of people have heard of the Big Dig in Massachusetts uh, that, that we had not too long ago, and that was sort of the, this unending civic project, uh, much like that. And this is basically a five mile hole that was punched in the Hoosick mountain range. And it took 25 years to do it. Numerous, uh, delays and incredibly extensive loss of life 
just a, a lot of really grisly death associated with it because it was using nitroglycerin early on in its uh, invention and just punching through at the time it was the, the oldest train tunnel that had been attempted to, to go five miles through. So there was a lot of stories of workers just being absolutely, you know, blown apart, disintegrated by nitroglycerin and falling down, you know, the central shaft into poisonous gas and rubble. And um, so people died really badly there. And there were also certain uh, incidences of violence and suicides and things that happened near or in the tunnel. So it pretty quickly took on, uh, even by the late 19th century, it already taken on a really sinister reputation as a place that was pretty badly haunted and pretty still unsafe even once it was open for use. There was quite a few deaths and derailments and you know running steam engines through uh, the tunnel, inadequate lighting. Uh, all told, well over 200 people have died in or around the tunnel. So it's it's uh, been a perpetual kind of uh, rite of passage, I think, for, for locals to, to go visit, you know, one or the other portal of the tunnel, uh, to walk down it, try to go in it and see, dare, dare themselves to see how far they'll go. It is still an active freight uh, train tunnel, so it's, you know, it has an element of uh, current danger, too. Wow. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's uh, really... Yeah, it's really become a quite legendary location. So, okay, wow. So it's still uh, – now, what are the, some of the more notable ghosts? If they're like – are there a couple that are the more you're likely to run into if you go in there late at night and are walking and not getting hit by a train? Yeah, there's uh, there's a guy named Ringo Kelly um, that uh, that were was in there um, that died uh, with uh, Ned Brinkman and Billy Nash. They're three of the, the people that are talked about probably the most often Brinkman and Nash were killed when, uh, when Kelly accidentally set off some explosives and, and then he was later found dead. So that's, that's, um, and then there's just, you know, sometimes people will go through, uh, old clippings and find, you know, just different. I mean, there's so many names to pick from. So if you're, if you're kind of inclined to go looking for EVPs or things like that. I think there's a lot of different names that people will call out into the tunnel sort of thing. But really, I mean, there's just so much death that I think it's it's almost more like the certain areas, like the central shaft where 13 men died, you know, really, really badly at one point in the construction um, in a cave-in and things like that. But to access the central shaft, you're, you you got to go a couple, good couple miles into this dark tunnel. So that's, that's not for the light of heart. Now, is this like you're not supposed to go there, but people go anyways? Is there a certain like time, like a certain time in the morning where if yeah. you go at like one eleven <laughs> or, or 3 a.m. or something, or is it just pretty much more in the evening? You could – there's a lot of bad karma there, and you could run across some of these people that were blown to pieces or something at some point. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I'm Corey. And I'm Daniel. And we are the hosts of the Light in the Darkness podcast. We're a supernatural and paranormal podcast with Christian perspective. We talk everything from angels and demons and aliens to cryptids and witchcraft. In each episode, we sit down with a guest and we listen to them share their stories of their encounters. Lots of folks, especially in the church, are experiencing weird stuff and they don't have anywhere to talk about it. And that is where we come in. We create a safe environment for folks to talk about when things got weird. We also like to inspire thought and conversation along the way. So subscribe to the Light in the Darkness podcast for bi-weekly chats about the stuff you don't talk about at church. Until then, take care, y'all. The only th strange thing that's happened to me personally, there was a point in which maybe about 10 years ago, I took a, a fellow journalist from a, a, a local magazine and we, we were doing a, a kind of a Halloween time tour of spots around the Berkshires and we, we ended off at the Hoosick Tunnel. We walked probably a good maybe a mile in and the odd thing for us was that every time wind seemed to keep pushing into the tunnel at us, like... You know, any, anytime we, when we started to try to walk out of the tunnel, it was like huge wind pressure against us. But then we'd stop walking and stand still for a minute and like the wind would completely die off. We 
we tried it like three or four times and it just kept happening. Like we'd walk forward and the wind would just kind of hit you with this force, like almost pushing us back into the tunnel. But then we just stopped walking out. And so that was, that was a little weird. Hey everybody, this is your paranormal podcast pal, Bob Heskey. You know, every night I like to listen to videos on YouTube. But lately, with COVID, civil unrest, market volatility, politics, conspiracy theories, I just want to tune out. (laughs) That's why I like Audible. What's Audible, you say? Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audio books, including some great horror and paranormal titles like A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay. If It Bleeds by Stephen King, and The Boatman's Daughter by Andy Davidson. This place is cursed. Each month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible Originals from a monthly selection, access to daily news digests, if you actually want to hear the news, as well as guided meditation programs. Hey, we all need a little zen now and again. And Audible is oh so easy. You can download titles and listen offline, anytime, anywhere, on any device. The app is free and can be installed in your smartphone or tablet. You can even listen across devices without losing your spot. How cool is that? If you can't decide what to listen to, no problem. You can keep your credits for up to a year and binge on your favorite series later on. So, here's the rub. The Afraid of Nothing podcast is stoked to partner with the audio bookworms at Audible to offer you a free 30-day trial membership. Just follow the link in the show notes, audibletrial.com forward slash AON podcast. Puedes repetir eso, por favor. That's audibletrial.com forward slash AON, all caps, podcast, lowercase. Full disclosure. I get a commission for everyone who signs up using that URL. But you get to try it for 30 days without a commitment. Using our custom URL doesn't cost you a penny and helps out the show if you do sign up. Nothing scary about that. So escape reality and pick up a book, an audio book, and listen to what's out there. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash AON podcast after listening to the show. Something that happened a while ago, 1969, the Berkshire UFO sightings and abduction. I, I just watched on Netflix's Unsolved Mysteries, like I think two nights ago, about that. You want to tell us? I mean, they're actually a, a, a series of UFO sightings in the Berkshires, but let's let's talk about this one first and any others that you're aware of. Yeah, the 69 sightings, it's very interesting because it's become really prominent the last 10 years, like increasingly, and even more so with the, the Unsolved Mysteries hit this year. I think that's probably the most high profile, but there's been a few television programs that have delved into it. But the interesting thing about that, from my point of view, is, you know, there were there was a whole lot of years when I was looking for UFO sightings and cases and things like that. The one with the covered bridge at Sheffield in, in 1969 was not anywhere on the radar. It was, it was never talked about. It was never publicly mentioned. It was never referenced in the media or print until 2009 when uh, allegedly one of the Reed family started to have had a new encounter with, and, and was abducted in Indiana, I believe. So that then led their family to discuss earlier things. And the Unsolved Mysteries what it left out is almost uh, more intriguing than some of the stuff that it featured. Because um, the full story that's been given to other UFO investigators over the years since the Reeds started discussing it was there, there were act- that was actually the third out of three encounters where Matthew and Tom Reed were allegedly taken at a young age uh, onto. Uh, I, I keep saying allegedly because I I do have a certain amount of skepticism for this case just because there, there are discrepancies in the way the story has been told at different times over the years, and certainly the doubts that anyone might have when you're talking about um, long-ago testimony, uh, especially from people who were very young, under 10 years old at the time. So that, I think there's a lot of murk around, around that, it, but it has certainly been uh, become probably the most media-publicized and, and famous UFO connection to the Berkshires. 
what's very really interesting to me is that at the time during the years that those uh, abductions uh, were allegedly happening to the Reeds, there was a guy um, a couple of towns away in, in the Berkshires who was writing article after article after article about his own contacts with uh, an alien species that he called the Corendians that had a heavy presence on the planet and an underground base under one of the mountains of the Berkshires um, and his, his uh, materials. There's well over 100 pages of, of these articles that he wrote all through the mid to late 60s in Flying Saucer Monthly. So not really not really capturing the, the broad public eye, but within UFO circles, you know, I think they were hearing about the Berkshires very often through the work of Bob Renaud and his, his chronicles. So, but it, it also kind of illustrates the way UFO lore has tended to change and the, and the tone and the narrative of stories that uh, at the time Bob Renaud was writing, that was still really in the contactee period where people were, George Adamski and people were talking to the Nugents and all these other benevolent races that were trying to warn us about nuclear weapons and don't destroy your environment, stuff like that, and uh, hadn't really entered into the phase where we were talking about greys and abductions. Even the Betty and Barney Hill had already told their story, the national conception of the UFO and, and alien phenomenon, if there was one, was was something very different from what we started to get to in the, in the 70s and 80s and with the uh, Travis Walton uh, incident, communion, books and movies like that. Yeah, and by the way, if you hear some kind of banging in the background, it's not Bigfoot. I have this... I have two dogs that both both have cones on their heads oh. right now. <laughs> and one is a 74-pound Siberian Husky slash lab mix with, like, they, all they have is this oversized cone. And he's so pissed because he can't get into his kennel. He can't eat his Kong or whatever. So he's trying to figure life out right now. So if you hear some lumbering in the background. Uh, I feel you, buddy. It's been that kind of year for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> We're all walking around with a cone in our head. Yeah. So let's go from UFOs to exorcism. The Passetto family, the exorcism in Lee, probably the most notable case in, in 1981, although there are other cases more historic before that. Yeah, back in 81, that definitely made a lot of waves and, and got a lot of national headlines. It's kind of funny how little remembered it is in the Berkshires now, but it, it, it was in, you know, all over the Associated Press. And they, they went on Geraldo eventually. I remember that episode. Uh, quite well around 1990. So the, the Passetto family lived in Lee and they reported a whole range of what they, what they called demonic activity. There was a, a metal bookcase that was tipped over and bent in two and, and they had scratches on them. And they had seen a uh, kind of what they called an imp, some kind of three foot tall ghoulish creature in their house. There was a lot of really overt phenomenon being reported. The police were called. Ed and Lorraine Warren eventually got involved. So that, that led to taking on an even higher profile. Of course, they were the go-to ghostbusters and demonologists for, for uh, at least the Northeast um, all through the 80s and uh, involved in the Amityville horror and that, the popularization of that you know, a number of other cases that are slowly getting turned into movies. So I, I assume the uh, Sato case and Lee will eventually get the get the movie treatment. Yeah, this could, what's it called? The uh, the Conjuring franchise. This could be in the Conjuring franchise yeah, eventually. Yeah, definitely could. Um, did it end in a successful exor- exorcism or how did it, how did it end? The details on, on the, uh, the exorcism, it was, you know, I mean, it was certainly an unofficial, exorcism which i mean it wasn't it wasn't necessarily sanctioned by the church as an official exorcism and, but ed and lorraine warren worked with a, a network of, of different uh, priests and things so you know the, the case did quiet certainly quiet down after that um and then they they eventually sold the house and uh, relocated but you know i haven't heard in the intervening years i've, I've heard about i haven't heard about any disturbances or strange going on. So yeah, not, I'm, I'm still not sure what exact category to, to file that case in. Yeah. It's, it's, it's good to have an exorcism though in the, in the file, which is good. 
What about Camp Wendingo? It sounds like your Friday the 13th type thing. It's like these 1980s cabins that were haunted by six little girls and apparently a crazy female camp counselor. You want to tell us what happened there? A lot of the uh, story of Camp Wendigo has kind of been retconned in the time since it was uh, abandoned. Certainly, like the, the, the stories of there being campers murdered, and, um, the, there's... There's no historical record of any of that happening. I mean, I was a kid in the '80s, and you know, I think even I would have cared. We had a, we had a couple of other incidents of um, child murder and child abduction in the '80s and '90s, and they were hugely well known throughout the county and you know extensively discussed in the media. I think what you have with Camp Windigo from the start, there was a certain amount of curiosity about what how it got its name. Because the, the Wendigo in Native American legend is a supernatural creature in different traditions, having different powers and um, quite a, a feared being. But there's there's no sign of whether or not the, the people who started the camp originally named it had any sense of that, or if they were aware of those traditions, or if it just could have maybe even been an accidental, you know, just a word that happened to be like a word in another language. The official Windsor history, the town of Windsor says that uh, the name comes with, uh, from it being very, very windy uh, on the hill there. So it was very windy. So they called it Windigo. I don't know if that's, you know, solid or not. So there, there's uh, outstanding questions about the, the name of the camp, which I think adds to the sense of mystery. And then you, you know, to see it's, it's been torn down in recent years, but I got to explore it. Uh, pretty extensively before that and you can definitely see you know it does screen it does have a screen like friday the 13th abandoned campsites and a campsite summer camp murder folklore is incredibly common you know sort of like not almost to the point uh a hook-handed killer or people hiding in the back seat of your car The, the the tales that kind of have the same structure in many many different towns and cities around the country and i think as people went up there and party and had seances yeah. and did ghost hunting and you know it, it, the the legend grew into this sort of epic thing where a whole bunch of kids have been murdered even though there's no record of any of it going on is that kind of what folklore is is the is it maybe not totally documented but tales around the campfire from from geographic areas that that, that came in in that may or may not have some semblance or truth, or does a lot of folklore, is it rooted in truth in, that, that you kind of look look at and write about? I think a lot of it is rooted in someone's truth. Sometimes it can be an emotional truth. I I, I was never trained as a formal folklorist. Um, I did take a class in college, but um, that's about as far as it went. But I, I've read some really great contemporary folklore, and it seems to be a, a consensus that with folklore, you're dealing with story about the past that, could be true. It isn't necessarily true, and it isn't necessarily fabricated. It's sort of in this indeterminate area. It's a vague and very convenient word that we like to slap on a lot of things because sometimes the historical record is fuzzy, and, and there, there is a great deal of mystery and debate. You know, so there's, there's room for narrative devices that can tell us the emotional truth that, of, of the place or where we are that sometimes ring more true. I think that's what our friend Jeff Belandra says there are ghosts and legends is another way for folklore yeah. too, where it's legends, where it's kind of those stories passed down through generations. You know that? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I wonder, are there any like Bigfoot folklore or anything? I know there is in the Bridgewater Triangle and Bridgewater Triangle, there's UFOs and there's satanic rituals and murders and all that stuff. Is there any kind of cryptid stuff going on in the Berkshires? There really, there really is. Yeah, there's a, a good event. In fact, um, uh, Loren Coleman uh, gives uh, the Berkshires a whole chapter in his Monsters of Ma- Massachusetts to uh, the Berkshire Bigfoot. There are several different sighting accounts uh, ranging from the, I think, I mean, the earliest Bigfoot story in the Berkshires is, is quite old for this country. Um, back in going all the way up back to 1765. Wow. It's yeah. very probably a newspaper hoax, but it's it's revealing because I think it shows that even even that far back before the dawn of the 
United States, it was there was a concept in the Americas of ape-like creatures, at least talking about them and thinking that they may be out lurking in the woods um, among us. And and then, of course, you know, as a lot of the New England was deforested um, over the 1800s. I think it took on an even even more of a mystique because there was almost sort of, you know, we were hearkening back to a wilderness that we were in the process of destroying at the time. And, of course, we've reforested a great deal of that now. And uh, so it's under different names. Yeah, the traditions of, of uh, Sasquatch-like creatures go back to uh, go back to the 17 and 1800s in the Berkshires, both hoaxes and question mark indeterminate sightings. Um, we were, some of the sightings of the, the Winstead wild man was a famous one of uh, the 1890s. Let's go back to the old, the, the tried and true ghost aspect of the Berkshires. There's a couple stories I'm thinking of. There's the Mount with Edith Wharton, the Edith Wharton estate in Lenox. I think you mentioned there's the uh, Searles Castle in Great Barrington. And maybe a third one would be the uh, the old coot of Greylock. I wonder if you could maybe wrap up by talking a little bit about each of those three stories. Sure. Um, yeah, the Mount has been a, a source of many, many ghost stories going back to when it was abandoned in the 1990s before it was restored and, and turned into a venue again. Well, the Mount was Edith Wharton's kind of attempts to, you know, not only her estate, but also her, her comment on many things. It was her, the child of her architectural views and ideas. And so even though she didn't actually live there all that long, it did take on a lot of mystique. Henry James, who was another great writer of stories, including ghost stories. And Henry James had some, had some real storytelling chops in the, the ghost arena. He spent a great deal of time there. There's always been a, a certain amount of rumor and hearsay that they uh, were romantically, you know, intertwined. So Edith and Teddy Warden, as, long, as well as Henry James, uh, are, have all been seen or experienced in different ways by people there. The Mount is kind of an interesting example of, I guess it's really kind of a cultural sea change in how tourism relates to the, the whole area of the paranormal. I can remember, you know, when I was starting my column in 2004 or 2000, 2005, and I'd be going to some of the local inns and theaters, and, and very, very few of them wanted to talk about sightings of ghosts. It was still kind of the, almost the Scooby-Doo idea of, like, it'll drive people away if it's haunted. And then that really has just done a, a complete 180 to People will definitely come if they think it's haunted. So there's been a, a definitely a, an embrace by the mountain. They do real booming business in October uh, with doing nighttime tours of the property that are very different from the kind of tours you get the rest of the year. And they, um, I've been to a Halloween party that were there that was just outstanding. It, ha it has all the flavor of, of the Gilded Age, Phantom Ray that you would want. And I think that, that really, you know, it's like the pinnacle Literary. There's other literary ghosts um, in the Berkshires and, and more minor stories, but that, the mountains really become an icon for it. But Searles Castle is a great place, too. So. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to Searles Castle, because you don't like usually think of yeah. castles in the Berkshires, but there's a couple yeah, of them. Well, um, yeah, Ed, Edward Searles was uh, an interesting guy. He was uh, a decorator for the, it, the house was actually built, I hesitate to even call it a house, but the, the estate was built for... Um, Mary Hopkins, who at the time was the, the widow of Mark Hopkins, and she was the richest woman in the country. She had millions from the railroads. So she retained Searles to be her, her decorator and kind of create this, this palace for her. And in the process, he became her suitor, even though he was 20 years her, her junior. And there was a, a little air of scandal around that. It was thought that he, he almost kind of browbeat her into marrying him by just scandalizing her by his attention to the point that you know she had to to save face but whatever the circumstances he built uh he had this um, castle built for her at incredible expense i mean it would have been it was 20 million dollars in in 1890s oh money. my god so <laughs> you know exorbitant by today's standards as some of these these estates at the turn of the century were and are now just they have to be 
schools or, or something else now as, as Searle's Castle is. But it was a bit suspicious to people because Mary Hopkins died within a year, year and a half of the, the completion of the castle. And there were rumors that Searle was dallying with a servant and they're, they, you know, making attempts to scare her and give her a heart attack and things like that. Um, and she eventually died of pneumonia, as I recall. But there, there's a secret staircase uh, in the castle that runs between two floors. Got occasion to see it a few years back. Um, it's just kind of a, a door in the wall that opens up and this tiny little secret staircase. And it's thought that maybe that was used for nefarious purposes. But but it's a, it's a magnificent structure. And he built a couple. He he went on from after he got irritated with the the town of Great Barrington. He went on to build another really large castle in New Hampshire, in addition to his, his giant estate in Methuen, Mass. So he was really into building big, big, you know, almost monstrously big <laughs> palatial structures. It was uh, the Trump of castles before. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, one place I forgot to mention before we close with the old coup to Greylock, the Houghton Mansion in North Adams, uh, chauffeur John Witters. I call him the chauffeur John Witters because he was – he was the man driving when a tragic accident happened, which he uh, took, I guess, the story goes, uh, he, he took his life for afterwards because he felt such guilt. Uh, Want to just regale us with that a little bit, and then we'll, we'll close with kind of a, a kind of a highlight version of the old coot of Greylock. Sure, yeah. Yeah, the Houghton Mansion is, is definitely an interesting building. That was, um, it was the former mayor of North Adams' home, and, and you know, as you mentioned, um, the... Uh, there was a terrible automobile accident that killed his daughter. John Witters, feeling responsible, did take his life uh, on the property. I think that really started to get talked about in the 90s when it became owned by the uh, the Freemasons. And so the Masonic Lodge there, uh, a couple of guys that come to know quite well, got really interested in the history of the house and in some of the things that they were kind of hearing and seeing in the building at night different times of day. So actually for a while, it was sort of the resident home of the uh, Berkshire ghost hunters. And they were um, kind of like a TAPS style paranormal investigation group. They would use their equipment and they would host ghost hunting events and overnights and things like that there. Um, so, I mean, I think when you have that receptivity towards it, like like the Houghton Mansion did and, and the Mount, you open up a whole other door uh, for people to come in and, you know, inv investigate in ways that a, a, a normal building might not. The, the Houghton Mansion has become one of the most extensively investigated haunted houses in possibly in, in you know, uh, southern New England. You can, you can find quite a bit online. Uh, people have posted EVPs that they've recorded and there's photos of, of uh, what appear to be people in the building when no one was there. There's a quality of evidence associated with that building that, that's interesting to me. Let's close on the old coot of Greylock. Kind of a tragic family love story about a guy who had to go to war, his his bride remarried, and he came back later on and stayed in the shadows. Even had dinner with them, but they didn't know it was him. And then he just died without them knowing his spirit lingers on, I guess. you want to give us the quick story of how that unfolded? Yeah, it's really a classic kind of Civil War era story of the loss and the alienation that I think a lot of people felt. And you have a guy who went away and was thought to be dead and then returned. And yeah, they said he even worked on his old farm a few times without being recognized by his, his former wife. The interesting thing about the old coup is it it probably that almost has the most known origin because i think there was no mention of it in the early 1900s or the late 1800s right up until the guys wanted to start a ski race down the thunderbolt trail of mount greylock and then all of a sudden almost like an early viral marketing campaign all of a sudden these stories of the old coup started to come out in the local paper about this uh, ghost that haunts this particular trail. And the North Adams transcript has had this really kind of cheeky relationship with stuff like that. It's, it's a newspaper that's no longer in business, but for the 150 years that they were, they were very um, 
they tended to be kind of on the playful side about stuff like that. And, and so I think over the years, there was multiple photos that were featured. Probably doctored uh, a little bit. They seem a little bit um, hokey, but it, it certainly got a lot of press and it's certainly helped popularize the ski race. Did he freeze to death or something? Was it winter and he didn't, he kind of got snowed in and he, he was found frozen to death or something? That's the story. Yeah. He was discovered dead of exposure and, uh, after, after a particularly bad storm. The, I can't remember the year offhand. There's some kind of, um, there's been some drifting. There's, there's, uh, he, he either haunts the Thunderbolt Trail or the Bellows Pipe Trail or a pair of other trails. We, we have a, a park ranger at Mount Greylock State Forest, Mike Whalen, Ranger Mike, who is one of the best story campfire storytellers of all time, and he tells an amazing version of the old coup. That's awesome. No, that's that's uh, you gave us quite a smattering of the Berkshires, so thank you so much. Is there anything that you're working on or that may be coming out in 2021, which we hope will be a better year than 2020? And if so, how can we follow you and keep up with what you're working on? I hope to have a, a book of been long awaited and had some holdups, but I hope to have a book called These Mysterious Hills out uh, in 2021. And uh, folks can follow me on Facebook, look for These Mysterious Hills, or go to thesemysterioushills.com. And I update pretty regularly still with uh, stories and, and odd historical finds and. Um, you know, just generally creepy, gothy stuff. So definitely check it out on Facebook, These Mysterious Hills or thesemysterioushills.com. This is cool. Thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate it, you know, sharing your knowledge and giving us a, a flavor of the Berkshires. We look forward to following you on Facebook and look forward to your book coming out in uh, 2021. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. been listening to the afraid of nothing podcast please subscribe and like us on facebook until next time stay scared hey you're still here great then why not listen to another episode visit afraid of nothing podcast.com to peruse all the shows that's afraid of nothing podcast.com And while you're there, click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout-out in an upcoming episode. And the world will know how swell you are.